one thing that is significant about this is the emphasis of all four of these words, and if you, we're going to go through the verses here in a moment, individually, but the emphasis is everybody shows up in one location. This is what's important about understanding these four passages in the New Testament, because it's the dead and the living joining together in one place. We're not in one place now. If you lost a loved one that's gone to be with Jesus, they are now in paradise. Their soul and spirit, 2 Corinthians 12, is in the third heaven in paradise. You are separated from them. You're alive on earth. But the coming is to resurrect the dead in Christ, and we who are alive shall meet them in the air, and so shall we ever be where? With the Lord. So the two are coming together. That's why the word gathering together and together is used when it talks about Jesus coming back for his people. Now what I would like to do, you can write these down, but listen to the verses carefully, because I'm going to read to you each of these verses, and I'm going to do an explanation on each one. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of the archangel, the trump of God, the dead in Christ shall rise first. We who are alive and remain shall be caught up to Together. Somebody say, caught up together with them in the cloud to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. The Greek word here is harpazo, harpazo, and it means to snatch out by force. It means to grab by the hair of the head and yank out of danger's way, and I like both of those. Because if the tribulation is coming, he wants to yank us out of danger's way. He wants to pull us out. He wants to snatch us up. Now the second scripture, uh, woo, hallelujah. I could go on and talk more about that word, but let's go to the next one. <clears throat> That in the dispensation of the fullness of time, he, Christ, might gather together in him, in one, gather together in one, all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even unto him. That's Ephesians 1, 9 and 10. Everybody say this, gather together in one. Say it, gather together in one. This is the Greek word that, honest to goodness, this West Virginia boy is not even going to try to pronounce. I can pronounce Hebrew, but Greek I'm just not. And it's about uh, five different syllables all put together. It means, however, to sum up or to gather in one place. So when he talked about this, it's summing it up, putting the summary of it, and putting everything that is out there collectively in one location. Now we have this word, which is the third verse. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. Everybody say gathering together. This word gathering together is a Greek word. Now it's, this is found again in 2 Thessalonians 2 and 1 and it means the assembling together. Alright? He, uh, in Hebrews chapter 10 and 25 it's used and it, it is the Greek word episynagoge. I can pronounce that one. And it means a complete collecting of the living and the dead all in one location. Now among the Jews of the Old Testament this Episynagoge was called the Great Assembly. The Great Assembly. And I'm going to explain that in just a moment. Now the fourth verse we mentioned a moment ago is Hebrews 12, 22 through 23. But you are come unto Mount Zion, unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to the innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men, made perfect. When are our spirits going to be made perfect? At the coming of Christ or the resurrection of the dead. Now he's saying that there are living people who have been caught up, dead people who have been raised, and he calls it the gen, I love this term, the general assembly of the church of the firstborn. The word general assembly is the Greek word panagurus, and it means all and to assemble, or we would say to assemble all, to assemble everyone. Now, who is going to be there? Go to the book of Revelation, I can tell you. The dead in Christ will be there. Number two, the living who have been changed from immortal to immortality will be there. Wait a minute, don't leave the angels out. Watch out. That's the angels, because it says we come to the general assembly to the innumerable a company of angels. We can't even number how many there are. And then we're going to have Christ there. We're going to have God the Father there. So this is the gathering of all angels, dead saints. I'm getting excited preaching this. Living saints. All gathered together in one location in the heavenly throne room. Revelation chapter 1 verses, actually 1 through about verse 8. You read it there. Now, this is important to understand. This word in Greek, panagurus, is a word that means a universal meeting. In other words, it's not just one selective location. It's everybody universally, glory to God, all coming together at one place. The, oh, preach on, Brother Stone. I think I will. Now, the Old Testament Jews, I said it just a second ago, called this word 
What, this, is the, this is the term that was used, the great assembly. Now for a moment, let me explain to you the Old Testament concept of the great assembly. If you've never heard this, it's very, very fascinating. After the destruction of Solomon's temple, the Jews went to Babylonian captivity. When they returned after 70 years from Babylonian captivity, they came back to Israel and rebuilt the temple. Now your Bible has two main books in it that deal with this. The book of Ezra, the book of Nehemiah. Now, all the Jewish sources that you study after will identify the same teaching, and here's how it goes. A group of elders met from 410 to 310 B.C. That's a period of 100 years. These elders were members of the Jewish Sanhedrin that had 70 members. Ezra and Nehemiah decided to expand it to 120. Oh, you'll get this in a minute. So, this 120 were brought together by Ezra the scribe, the, the person who we believe wrote the book of Ezra, of course. And these were men that had kept what's called the oral tradition. This is what it means. That there's a lot written in the Torah, the five books, but there's a lot that's not written. You all know that there's a lot written in the four Gospels about Jesus, but the Bible says in John that if all the works he did could be written while he was living, all the earth couldn't contain the books of what Jesus... You, you with me? So, in order that the oral tradition, and these are the things that Moses taught Joshua, Joshua taught the elders, they taught their kids, so that this would not be lost, they decided to write it down. And this is where you come up with the Jewish oral tradition that the Jews study to this day. It came, it came out of this special meeting. However, here's what began to happen. These men put together the Hebrew Bible, the Torah, the prophets, and the writings. They formalized all the prayers that would be prayed around the Jewish temple and around feast days, which Jews celebrate to this day and still keep even though they don't have a temple and they gave the Bible or the scrolls to the common man in the synagogue to be able to read so this is what the this group which was called the great assembly did Haggai was part of it the prophet Zechariah was part of it Malachi was a part of it Ezra was a part of it Nehemiah was a part of it during this hundred year period now Here's what's interesting. The word Knesset. Does anybody ever hear them talk about the Israeli Knesset? The word Knesset means assembly, and it just so happens there's 120 members. Come on. Come on. Okay, where do they get it from? Great. The, what I'm talking about, they took it from... Ezra and Nehemiah assembling the 120 elders together. That's where the Knesset originates in, in Israeli politics. Now, having said that, let's show you a parallel of the great assembly in the New Testament. Because if the great assembly is a picture of the rapture, if it's a picture of the getting together of the saints and the church, then there ought to be links here somehow, right? Because the Jews knew this. The Jews that wrote the New Testament, they knew about this Ezra and Nehemiah assembly. Now watch. First of all, Jesus knew the temple would be destroyed. So he's, in 1 Corinthians 3.16, Paul wrote and said, Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Watch this. Number two, who organized the church? 120 in an upper room. Mm-hmm. Listen, we always thought that was a random number. That's not a random number. The reason they chose 120 is that's how many were in the great assembly. You're checking it out. You had to have that same number to start the church that was in the great assembly. So there's 120 in the upper room. That's Acts chapter 1 verse 15. The apostles held on to the oral stories, the oral tradition of Jesus' ministry and what they do with it. They said, this is going to be lost unless we write it down. So they wrote gospels. Come on, are you listening? And then they gave what? They gave the gospels so that the scriptures would be given and the common men were able to have the scriptures. So in other words, the way the church was formed is the same way that this great assembly was formed by Ezra. So the Jews in the upper room were paralleling what they already knew existed because they understood that this was a new organism being formed in the earth by God. Well, I hope you're getting this because I'm getting more excited because I know where I'm going and you don't. <laughs> 